Back when Wolfenstein Enemy Territory was first being worked on in the early 2000s, its developer, a British studio called Splash Damage, ran a closed beta test for just a handful of players. This group would offer their feedback on all sorts of different aspects of the game, from the map design, to the respawn timer, to the weird grenade physics that allowed some players to chuck them around corners in a way they really shouldn't have been able to. However, perhaps the single most peculiar response that Splash Damage received from this group of players was that the Allies Thompson submachine gun was considerably better than the Axis equivalent, the MP40. The general consensus was that if you had a Thompson, it was slower, but harder hitting. And if you had the MP40, it was faster, but it was weaker. Uh, the Thompson was sort of like this more boxy, smaller, it's a, it sort of had like a, I don't know, a sturdier kind of feel to it. You'd use it until you could and then begrudgingly get the MP40, just because, at least in the single player games, there were more of them and that carried over a bit into the multiplayer games. But the thing is, enemy territory, just like loads of the objective team shooters, was designed in a way that should have made this impossible. Not unlikely, but impossible. Because yes, the game may have had you playing as an Axis soldier using Axis weaponry and have you competing against a team of allied soldiers using allied weaponry, but that difference was only ever a surface level thing. The guns, for the sake of balance, had the exact same stats. The M1 Garand mirrored the Carabiner 98K, the Colt was identical to the Luger, and the Thompson was no different to the MP40. So why were players saying something else? What had gone wrong here? I put those questions to Ed Stern, now the lead writer for Splash Damage, although if you're familiar with the credits for Enemy Territory, perhaps you knew him better as Ed Bongo Boy Stern instead. He told me that to begin with, the team assumed this was just a mistake. They could open up the config files for both weapons and see that numerically, players were essentially comparing the exact same gun. They're identical, they're absolutely the same. Damage, uh, rate of fire, reload speed, clip size, absolutely the same. The players are wrong, this is, this is bad feedback. And then we look at the server data and players are getting more kills with the Thompson than the MP40. The players are right. How? What, what, what's going on here? And the one thing we trace it to is the Thompson had bassier audio. It just sounded more powerful. So players felt more powerful, they felt more confident with it, they went for more headshots, they got more headshots, they got more kills, the players were right. So the fix for it was to change the audio, not the weapon. <laughs> we, we just put less bassy audio on it and they felt more similar and you know that sort of solved the problem. It may not have been a perfect fix, I should point out, as some WET players believe, even to this day, that the Thompson is in fact the superior SMG. But either way, I think it's a really interesting problem for a game developer to try and tackle. It's the game design equivalent of that time Ron Weasley figured he'd been slipped a lucky potion before his big Quidditch match and then played an absolute blinder in front of the Gryffindor hoops. Now if you were tasked with trying to balance the game of Quidditch right then and there and you were to ask Ron for some feedback mid-game, he's going to tell you, listen, hands up, I've necked half of Felix Felicius here and that's probably why I'm playing so well. That's your problem. That's the thing that needs fixing. But that wouldn't actually be the case, would it? Really, you'd be looking at some kind of placebo doping scandal here and you'd probably want to at least suspend Harry Potter from Hogwarts while you conducted an investigation. Probably Hermione as well. I mean, she knew about it. She might not have been happy that it was happening, but she didn't exactly grass them up either, did she? Hang on, what was I talking about? The point I'm making is this. The discussions between players and developers about what's wrong with a game or even what's right can be way less straightforward than we'd like to think. It's what game designer Adrian de Jong describes as evil data. Here's him talking about the concept at GDC just a couple of years ago. So evil data is playtesting results that are distracting, that are unclear or that are misleading. Um, and in turn, that may lead to you guessing what to do. It may lead to a worse game. It may lead to a less unique game, longer development time, and you know many other bad scenarios. There are some really fantastic examples of this, like when that game company was doing some early tests for Journey, a game about exploring a vast desert landscape and occasionally meeting other players. Although importantly, as you'll know if you've played it, you can never speak to these people or type messages or anything so direct. Now, the team had considered including friend invites at one point during development, and incredibly, some of the feedback they received suggested allowing proper voice chat integration because players wanted to be able to talk to the friends they'd then chosen to play with. That's somewhat understandable, right? Players could see each other, they're jumping around, they're helping one another through the environment. Why not also offer the option to allow them to talk as they play? Well, because in the words of creative director Genova Chen, Journey is a game about strangers. It's more unique if you don't know how old they are, who they are, and you just look at them as a pure human being. 
The problem wasn't the lack of voice chat then, it was that players knew who they were playing with. And so that's what they changed. There's another fascinating story from the World of Warcraft beta about how players hated a system known as Fatigue XP, which meant the longer you played, the less experience you'd eventually receive for defeating enemies. To get rid of that fatigue, you'd need to find an inn and then just log off for a while. The idea being Blizzard wanted a way to discourage players from staying online for too long without taking a break. And while their feedback was simple, get rid of it. Just like with Wolfenstein's SMGs, there seemed like an obvious solution to the problem. It just needed fixing. But instead of reacting to that initial response, the team at Blizzard took a step back and realized that the problem wasn't necessarily the system itself, but the framing of that system. And so they flipped it on its head. They patched the game so that players would receive bonus XP when defeating enemies if they'd recently logged off while at an inn. The actual numbers here didn't end up being much different, but rather than discouraging players from overplaying, they managed to encourage players to regularly log off instead. That did the trick. The complaints for this system largely disappeared with that patch. This back and forth over feedback can be an art form in and of itself. Yes, sometimes you do need to just make the gun less powerful, but other times you'll need to filter that good data from the evil data, as Adrian de Jong might say. But it's gotta be a difficult line to walk, I'm sure. I asked Splash Damage's Ed Stern what the team had learned from tweaking the Thompson sound effect all those years ago, and how it applies to their development process now and how they interpret player feedback. I think it has had a big influence on us, uh, kind of institutionally, because I think we went into it with a very determinist, algebraic mindset of this, therefore that, if that, then this, then player does this, therefore we change that and the end result is this. And the more we've done it, the more we've realised that people are not data driven in the same way that code is, that people's reactions are human and emotional and they're the result of lots of things not all of which they are aware of and the kind of rule of thumb with this which is a bit of a cliche is that players are hardly ever wrong about how they feel but they're usually wrong about why that is i think that's sort of bullshit i think i think that's a, a, a really big simplification but it's not always wrong like definitely you get oh it's definitely like this it's because of that and like no well that's the res that's the resultant vector of loads of different things. Changing the music in combat, changing the ambience, the way the, the, the footfall audio works, changes people's perceptions of what the weapon damages are. Because it changes, what's the way of putting it? The adjectives and adverbs change the verbs in the game. Like the whole feel of it is made of so many different elements and people, as with cinema, tend to downplay the audio side of things. Actually, audio is a fantastic persuader um, and has a really massive impact, sometimes greater than the impact of actually changing the stats on the weapons. It's a weird thought though, isn't it? To think that two weapons with identical stats can feel so different in a player's hands uh, just because of the way they look or the way they sound. I mean, I say that, but I don't think you'd find me falling for something so trivial. Well, that was a daft way to end the video. Um, hopefully the right kind of daft. We'll see what the comments have to say. We are a serious video games journalism outlet here at People Make Games. Please don't forget that. And do you know what else we take seriously? Internet security.
Thanks to Dashlane for sponsoring this month's episode. Dashlane is an app for iPhone, Android, Mac, or PC that's designed to keep you safe on the internet while simultaneously handling a bunch of stuff that you probably find quite tedious. Like, for example, now that Steam doesn't have quite the same monopoly over the PC gaming market, you're maybe gonna want a couple of new passwords because, hey, you're a responsible internet user who doesn't still use the same password that you came up with in high school, right? Dashlane lets you create passwords that look like this and then you can store them all in one place so you'll never have to click forget password again. But hang on, storing passwords all in one place sounds like a terrible idea. That's a good point and that's also why Dashlane stores and decrypts all of your information locally on your device using a master password so even if Dashlane itself were to get hacked, your passwords would remain safe. On top of this, Dashlane comes with a built-in VPN so you can keep your location private even while using unsecure Wi-Fi networks and it'll also store any personal and credit card info that you want storing. If you head over to dashlane.com forward slash make games, you can get started for free on your first device. And then if you'd like to upgrade to premium so you can use it across all of your devices, you can use the code make games to get 10% off. Thanks again to Dashlane and thanks also to you for watching this video. If you'd like to support our work, we are largely funded by our patrons over at patreon.com forward slash people make games. Uh, people that support us get access to a whole backlog of extra goodies like a monthly patron show and behind the scenes videos. But most of all, they allow us to do what we do full time, which we're incredibly grateful for. Uh, yeah, hope you like this one and we'll see you real soon. Goodbye. Oh, that's weird motion blur. Look at that. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go now.